And you're very welcome along to the NFL show on Off the Ball. Uh, the, the sad reminder hits us this week that there's only 16 weeks of the regular season left. We may as well enjoy it, every minute of it while we possibly can. Uh, we're going to speak with Kian Fahey a little bit later on. But to get right off the bat, uh, we're starting with a very special guest this week. Sam Monson of PFF joins us. Star of Sky's Sunday afternoon coverage. Sam, that was a big surprise. How are you doing? Doing good, Jar. How about you? Yeah, good. You're looking great at the, uh, at the weekend. So how did that come about? What's the story? You guys are, are you going to be on every week? Yeah, every week we've got a, a partnership with Sky Sports this season, uh, Sky and PFF. We're supplying them with a bunch of data, try and you know improve their broadcast, give them a bunch more information to go. And part of the package is they're they're stuck with us as well on the on the broadcast. Very good. And are their offices as nice as the uh, the old Newstock offices that we used to broadcast from all those years ago? Uh, I haven't actually been to their office. We're we're broadcasting ah, live in from uh, from a Cincinnati studio over here in PFF, so we're all remote. Very nice. Listen, a brief uh, explanation of PFF. We've done this loads of times, obviously, in the past, but a, a whole new audience keeps coming to this and kind of realizing that the data revolution has really affected football, particularly in the last five or six seasons, where initially it seemed like there was this mad kind of... Um, and you could even see a bit of it from, uh, from Rob Ryan in the studio, like, no, nah, I'm still a football man at heart. But it turns out that... Um, most football people are finally accepting that the analytics have a story to tell as long as you know what you're doing. And that's the thing. There, there's a big scale in all of this. It's not just, you know, any one thing. So when we first started doing stuff together, Jerry, I think we had like 12, 13 teams. We're up to all 32 now. All, all 32 teams are PFF customers. We've got, I think, 43 college football teams as well as customers. So we're everywhere. And, and the key is how teams use us. There's a different level of scale. Some teams just take some data, run some reports, and they're good. Other teams were integrated completely into their systems. You know, you've heard John Gruden talk about how he used to spend a day or two making cut-ups at the start of his week, and now it's all done for him. PFF just gives him the ability to click buttons, and you get those cut-ups right away. So we, there's so many different ways that we help teams, and that's before you even get into our play-by-play -play grading stuff. And, you know, I think that's where our real differentiator is, is that – we're not just giving you numbers, we're giving you the ability to uh, add context that you're never going to get from a data set. And it started to become common parlance amongst the people who are covering the sport as well. So um, some of the, the Niners podcasts that I would listen to, they would talk about PFF grading. And over a period of time, you just begin to realize where the scale is and whether or not somebody's actually grading out well. So you can tell if an offensive lineman, if a guard, for example, is actually, if he does well against the run or if he does well against the pass. And that's when you begin to understand the nuances of the individual player. Yeah, and even, you know, if you don't agree with PFF's grading scale necessarily, what, what's important is that we're doing the same thing for every single player in the league. So, you know, you might have your own system. You look at your game. You're a Niners fan. You watch your guys every single play, and you say, well, I don't think this guy is as good as PFF says he is. You're like, okay, but if you haven't looked at how he compares to the Detroit Lions guard and the, the Jacksonville Jaguars guard, you don't really have a great idea of context, you know, where this guy sits compared with everybody else in the league. Whether you agree with PFF system or not, the important thing is that we're doing it for everybody in the league. So at least it's a, it's a, a constant. It's a comparing apples to apples thing when we start to talk about player evaluation. That's the individual stuff, and that's the kind of stuff that it definitely gets published. Is there, like, super secret extra sauce that you're giving to the teams of the information that they have access to? Yeah, the, the teams have a whole kind of extra layer of stuff, not just uh, into the, the, the kind of the ability to, to fold into their data systems and their video systems, which is a big selling point for them. But we um, have been working a lot on our advanced analytics stuff internally over this offseason. We created a, a PFF war metric, a wins above replacement thing. Any baseball fans will be pretty familiar with, with war as a statistic. It's never existed in football before, and we've kind of developed that over the offseason. And we're, NFL teams are hugely excited by that. Um, the other thing that they've been falling over themselves trying to get more of this offseason is our uh, ball charting data. So not just whether a quarterback was com the pass was complete or not, but where did he put it? Was it right where it should be? Was it off to the side? You know, where exactly was the ball location? We had teams coming back to us during the draft process and saying, this is fantastic. Could we just get this done for this quarterback? No real reason, you know, just, <laughs> just if we could see the data set for this guy, it would be kind of important to us, maybe. Yeah, and is that the type of stuff that at some point um, you make public or do you always keep it private so that you can sell it to the individual teams and then do it on spec? 
Yeah, I think there's always some stuff that's going to be reserved for teams. There's certain things that's just too valuable for them. Um, and obviously, that's a huge part of our, our business. Um, but a lot of the stuff we try and bring out to the public, certainly in you know small bits, even if we can't bring out the whole thing, we'll try and give you the, the, the best nuggets or insights from this data. So we, you know, our draft guide had a lot of that advanced ball charting data in it. We were able to quantify just how accurate a guy like Baker Mayfield is. And we were saying he was the best quarterback in this draft all the way through the process, you know, all the way from October onwards, um, whereas everyone else was surprised when he went, you know, the number one overall pick. Yeah. And look, it's speculation, obviously, but it's it's not wild speculation to think that the data and the analytics and John Dorsey making that ultimate decision to pick this guy first, that there is a coalescence of factors. Obviously, he had to have the right character that they wanted. He had to be able to take the weather in Cleveland. He had to be able to take the fact that he is a messiah in a city currently without one. And they obviously felt that he could do that. But at the same time, he needed some stats to back up the fact that his instinct was that he's the right guy. And I've no doubt that... Um, when he can at least look back and say, I can point to evidence. Because you know the owners are going, give me the evidence. I got rich on uh, using evidence to make my money turn from a small heap into a big heap. Show me the evidence. And this obviously helps these guys make these decisions. Yeah, and that's another kind of benefit to PFF is we're able to be everybody's, uh, everybody's scapegoat almost. You know, here's why you make this decision. So agents, you know, here's why this guy deserves more money. Look at these PFF numbers. Teams, here's why this guy doesn't deserve the money. Look at this PFF evidence. You know, guys, GMs making decisions, the, the PFF data set. It's, it's, we've been used as that almost across the board now. It's one of the, the things that PFF has become is every, everybody's excuse, everybody's reason for making moves. Yeah, and I think most people probably are, are familiar with the fact that um, this is Chris Collinsworth's baby, that it helps have somebody with his profile and just to standing in the game be a front man for all of this yeah definitely i mean chris's big benefit wasn't just bringing in coming in and, and bringing investment to it chris allowed us to do college football which was a big differentiator in us but chris will open any door you need opening you know at the at the nfl level when we first started doing this just getting in front of teams was a challenge once you actually sat down with them they were blown away by what this could do and, and what the data we had was, but just getting the meetings was tricky. Now, with, when you got Chris Collinsworth as your face, at least everybody's taking your phone call. One last question that um, people will uh, be interested in. I know certainly all of our, our Irish viewers. How does somebody from Ireland end up getting to work in the NFL industry? Because, you know, we have these stories where Pat Murray becomes a kicker and he's like, got very strong Irish connections. There's a few others who have kind of just about made it and then there's second and third generation Irish names littered throughout the NFL. But actually working in the industry, there's not that many people. No, I mean, I got lucky, really. I, I knew Neil Hornsby, PFF's founder, um, actually from you know an online message board, the NFL UK's official chat board. Um, really, all of the first guys from PFF came from there. We all just kind of knew each other chatting away. Neil needed some guys to help come on and start doing the grunt work of this system that he kind of created in his um, in his office at home just as a hobby. So I was one of the first guys in the door. We started doing this and and realized, you know what, this, this could turn into something. If we were actually able to do all these games, get this entire data set, people would be interested in this information. So I just got in on the ground level and, and it's really snowballed from then. It became a big thing to the point where a guy like Chris Collinsworth heard of it, checked it out, was so fascinated by it, he bought the thing. And then, you know, I've been able, I've been lucky enough to, to get imported over here to Cincinnati and be part of the, the whole face of this thing. And were you involved in the sport beforehand? I, I literally never asked you this before, even off air. Well, no. Like, no, so it was just a complete career change. No, th so I was, I was in DIT doing a master's in journalism, having been through several other courses and bailed on whatever career they was, <laughs> those were going to present me. So I, I just knew him and I had enough time because I was... Uh, a full-time student at that point to do games on the side and, and kind of do it part-time, uh, then then ended up getting you know doing it full-time for a while and and that's 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 the story. Yeah, well, okay, great. Uh, I mean, you know, journalism's a cutthroat trade these days. Always good to have <laughs> a, a a nice 
thing to escape to, which turns out to be your life's calling. Let's talk a little bit about some of the stories that you've been working on just recently. Obviously, um, people will be familiar with your written work down through the years, but obviously you guys are pumping out the video uh, a lot at the moment and everybody should check out your YouTube channel. Um, but in particular, I wanted to ask you about um, the situation with Washington because obviously they had strung Kirk Cousins along for a number of seasons and it was clear that a bunch of people, important people, the decision makers, didn't really feel like Kirk Cousins was going to be the future of that franchise. They signed Alex Smith and it seems like they've got the very best version of Alex Smith. We're one game in, the sample size is small and, and not to jump to conclusions, but certainly last week's performance and it, it, last week's performance seems like a continuation of all the good stuff that he's been doing. Yeah, it's interesting. Alex Smith, he gets he's a very specific type of quarterback. You know, he's pathologically conservative with the football. He just does not put the ball deep down the field, doesn't put it in harm's way. Um, and it gets the term game manager gets thrown around. It's like a pejorative term. People hate game managing quarterbacks because they're never going to do what Aaron Rodgers was able to do on Sunday night football against the Chicago Bears. They're not going to make that 20 point comeback, making those absurd throws deep down the field. Um, so everybody, everybody wants better than that. But if you have a really good game managing quarterback, if the rest of your team is in good shape, it's actually a really good thing to have because you know that guy is just not going to be the reason you lose games. He may not be able to, to come back in a game that you basically have no business winning anyway, but he won't be the reason you're in the hole in the first place, which is a valuable thing to have. And for a team like Washington, for the first time in a while, the rest of the roster looks capable of winning. You know, the offensive line is good. They've got some impressive weaponry and offense. Um, the defense looks like it could be really good, particularly up front. They've got a whole host of young guys that can all get pressure. Jonathan Allen, a guy we loved coming out of Alabama. Matt Ioannidis, a guy I loved coming out of Temple and is getting, you know, suddenly getting a huge amount of pressure for them. So suddenly the rest of this roster has all come together, and now they need a quarterback to just steer the ship. And Alex Smith is really good at keeping accurate on the underneath stuff. I actually dug out a cool stat the other day that, so his career interception rate is absurd. I think he's in the top five all time or something. But, you know, PFF's grading allows you to track other things. And we, we track something called turnover worthy plays. So let's say you throw the ball directly to a linebacker, that guy drops it. It's not an interception, but it's a terrible pass and it should be an interception. So if every single pass that Alex Smith ever put in the air that we deemed a turnover worthy play was intercepted over his career. He would still have the 13th best interception rate in NFL history. He just does not put the ball in harm's way. And, you know, the trade-off for that is that he doesn't, he's not very aggressive down the field, but he's really good at keeping it underneath, being accurate, and just not turning it over. Because it felt a little bit like they'd become something of a joke franchise in recent seasons, partly because they, they had this quarterback that was coveted by some of the smartest minds in football, and yet they didn't want him, but they didn't know how to manoeuvre their way out of that situation, and partly because of the injury situation that they found themselves in as well. They have this amazing uh, tight end who is explosive when he's fit, but he wasn't fit, and then last year they had no running backs who uh, were able to survive the injury situation that they had. They had a first-round receiver go down with injury fairly early on in his career as well. It just felt like the whole thing, not to mention the, the ownership situation, it just felt like it wasn't being run in, a, in, in an omnidirection. Now it feels like they have everything that they need in place to be competitive in ultimately a very competitive division. Yeah, the, the Cousins thing is interesting because I, I think Alex Smith, going to Alex Smith and being willing to pay him significant money, it does fit with not wanting to pay Kirk Cousins money because they may be a similar level quarterback when all said and done, but they're very different stylistically. Alex Smith, we talked about, is that conservative guy who won't put the ball in harm's way. Cousins is the other way. He's a much more volatile guy. He's capable of executing big comebacks, making these big time throws down the field, but he'll also turn the ball over a lot more. He'll make a lot more boneheaded decisions that you just look at and say, what were you thinking on that play? So this is clearly a, a defined strategy that we want a quarterback to just steer the ship. We don't need a guy um, to, to be the, the quarterback that carries everything on his shoulders particularly if you if you know that neither one of those guys is Aaron Rodgers. You know, neither one of these guys is the very best of the best. So if we're stuck with a guy who's not quite the best in the league, they, they're obviously determining that it's better to have a conservative version of that than a much more volatile, um, you know, high-risk, high-reward version. At a much cheaper price, obviously. 
Yeah, although they're still paying Alex Smith like a significant sum of money. I think definitely the Cousins price tag scared them off. This idea of making a quarterback the best paid passer in the league was clearly a thing for them. Um, but they're paying Alex Smith a lot of money. I think it's just a conscious uh, direction to set to 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 be a, a more conservative offense. One other team that I wanted to talk to you about before we, we uh, get to some of the other um, appliances that, uh, or applications rather that um, people can use with PFF. Um, I wanted to talk to you about Atlanta. A significant disappointment about just how anemic their offense looked in the opening game of the season against the Eagles last week, primarily because it was exactly the way they looked at the end of last season when you thought, well, at least they're going to have a full off season to fix that. They paid Matt Ryan. There's no way Matt Ryan's coming back into the same offense as they had last year. And obviously, they've got the weapons that they need because we've seen them be so amazing with the same players. Clearly, they'll fix this. And then nothing had been fixed. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things that jumped out of that game. The first one was Matt Ryan looked terrible. I mean, awful. And, you know, great quarterbacks are capable of bad games, and that's not a huge surprise. What was a really big surprise to me is that his arm looked awful. His arm strength looked terrible. There was a bunch of passes where he just fluttered. It reminded a lot of people of that Peyton Manning game where he first came back from his neck injury, and he he realized, against the Falcons, actually, that, oh, I, I can't even make the throws that I used to make in the past. I have to change my game right here and right now, or this is going to be a disaster. And he stopped he basically stopped throwing the ball down the middle of the field on those sort of deep seam passes that everybody came to expect from the Colts. Like Matt Ryan's arm looked like that, but without any neck injury to explain it away. It's just, it was bizarre. I don't know if he's carrying an injury or something, but that was strange and concerning if they don't fix that pretty quickly. The other thing that came out was, I think the offense or Matt Ryan was better than he, a season ago than the stats showed. But if there's one area where the criticism is valid, it's their red zone offense, which is just, it's a disaster. They don't seem to have any clue what they're doing in the red zone. Um, you know, they, they took Julio Jones off the field for like three consecutive goal line plays early in the game and then seemed to overcompensate for that later in the game by just forcing the ball to him double covered. Their red zone plays are a mess. And if you look, it's so it's such a great contrast with a team like the Eagles who clearly know exactly what they're doing in the red zone. You know, when they get there, they have a plan, they have plays specifically designed for it, and you can see the whole thing functioning. When the Falcons get there, it's almost like a surprise, and they just they just spin a, a you know spin the wheel of fortune to find out what play they're going to call. Does the um, placing Deion Jones on IR does that effectively? I mean. You're not saying it's a season ender for them, but it, it would it be a miracle for them to be able to recover from that loss and be as competitive as they were and to go as deep even as they did last season? Yeah, that's a major, major blow to their defense. Deion Jones is one of the most important players in the league, I think, to his team's defense. He's also arguably the best coverage linebacker in the game. Um, you know, he makes plays that other linebackers can't. They rely on his speed to be able to combat all of these matchup weapons. And if you look just at the division they're in, it's stacked with those guys. You know, Alvin Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, Greg Olson, although he's injured with a foot injury himself now, so that shouldn't be a factor. But Deion Jones is the guy you use to neutralize these guys. Most teams don't have a Deion Jones that's athletic enough to match up with those players, but the Falcons did. And even just last year, if you look at the number of games late in the game where Deion Jones was basically single-handedly responsible for winning them games. He had a game-ending interception in the end zone against the Saints one week. That won them the game. Um, he broke up a couple of passes intended for Greg Olson when the Panthers were driving to try and win the game. He was the guy that broke up a pass to Sammy Watkins in the playoff game in the end zone that again swung that game. Like Deion Jones was literally winning them games last season and a good number of them. Um, and now they don't have that. They're, they have the rest of their linebacker core just is not anywhere near the same. So he can still come back the, the way you know, injured reserve works now is that those guys can return, but it's after like eight weeks. That's going to be a long eight weeks for the Falcons to try and tread water until he's back. Was linebacker as important 15, 20 years ago as it is now? Has there been a bit of a shift towards those athletic types of linebackers who can help with the run stuffing, but also drop into coverage and and cover tight ends, for example, or cover some of the the uh, the underneath receivers? I mean, if anything, I think it's gone the other way, that linebacker is, is almost less important now than it's ever been before. But there's a specific type of linebacker that moves the needle unlike anything else. And that's that's Deion Jones. It's Luke Keekley for the Panthers. If you've got a guy 
that can excel in coverage. That that's really the key in the passing game. The league, it's like two thirds passing these days. It used to be fifty fifty. It used to be heavy run league. Now, if you've got a guy that can go in coverage and can cover these tight ends and these running backs, you know, t- today's NFL offenses have become all about matchup problems. You find a guy that the defense can't cover, whether it's a running back, whether it's a tight end, and a guy you can move around into the backfield, split him out wide, move him in line tight end. You just don't know what to do with him as a defense. Guys like Deion Jones, those athletic coverage linebackers, they allow you to match up with those players in a way most teams can't. One last thing I wanted to ask you about. I've, I've um, used PFF in the past for uh, fantasy advice, and I, I, make, uh, I make no apologies to my rivals <laughs> in fantasy for that. But uh, also, it clearly has some applications in gambling and with uh, the gambling rules in the states slowly catching up with the rest of the world presumably this is a big growth area for you guys it really is so this off season we had a lot of time to dive into our own, our own data and kind of do stuff with it that we haven't had a chance to do before one of the things we started doing is well let's fold in pff data to predicting outcomes of games and you know our our data scientist guys, our analytics, uh, Eric Eager is our chief data scientist. He likes the term data scientist. So we'll, we'll roll with that for the moment. But one of the things Eric has been doing, he's a maths professor by trade, and he's been able to like work out what percentage of, so the Vegas spread, the Vegas line PFF can predict. And it's, it was, it was a huge number. So we start thinking, well, okay, let's fold in all of this PFF data and figure out how many times we can basically beat Vegas by, predicting what the line should be and what the over-under should be and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think they came 23rd out of 20,000 entries and 538s against the spread competition last season. So it looks very good, this model. And so we launched a product this, pr- pr- this preseason. It's just gone live called PFF Green Line, which basically identifies the games each week where the PFF data says the money line is off, says Vegas is missing something. And if you dial in on those games alone – you let's just say you have a significant chance of winning some money against those those games. It'll be very interesting to see how that holds up and whether or not then Vegas adapts by just checking and going, oh, hang on, the PFF guys have this figure, so I'm going to change the line here. Uh, you know, <laughs> they they, uh, they didn't get rich by um, sitting on their hands and kind of not That's using the bits of information they had. Sam, great to have you on. Thanks a million. Congratulations on everything. Absolutely, any time. Let's do it again. We'll see you uh, next Sunday. Are you on every Sunday on Sky Sports now? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's every Sunday we're going to have a few segments throughout uh, the game. So, yeah, I'll be on your TVs. Good stuff. Well, we look forward to it. Sam Monson there from PFF, and uh, you should check out those um, PFF stuff, particularly if you are interested in fantasy. They've got a great product for you as well. And, look, if you're, uh, if you're into betting, and uh, some of us are, then uh, any bit of advice is always good advice if uh, it's going to win you some money. Uh, right, so we're going to talk Kian Fahey in a minute. We'll bring you the results from last weekend. We'll also bring you the schedule for this weekend and the standings after weeks one and two. Mike Carlson joined us on OTB AM this week, and in typically inimitable Mike Carlson, fashion we ended up talking a bit of wwe well he did all it I'm, and i hate to use another wrestling metaphor but you know what it needed was someone to play the music and then have the announcers go that's aaron Rodgers' music and have him come walking out onto the onto the field um and it was amazing because i think partly khalil mack ran out of gas in the, in the uh, second half which is what happens when you don't have any preseason. um to get ready but partly they also adjusted and rogers it's a knee injury of some sort i'd suspect a sprain in in his um acl but he wasn't moving all that much but they were he was simply sliding a bit in the pocket they picked up their protection to give him some time and then you you just watched him hit receiver after receiver in in perfect positions uh and they weren't doing anything fancy to get them open either they were just coming down in it and it, it was clinical and um of course, there was a dropped interception. The the always the kind of uh, the, the kind of uh, untold story it was you know a sitter in the, in the fourth quarter that uh, if it were intercepted, there goes the Packers rally win and the story. But it didn't happen. And um, two big plays: one to Geronimo Allison, whose name I love, and one to Randall Cobb. And um, you know, it, when you hit a receiver in stride, oh, a lot of good things can happen. Uh, and, and that's what happened with Cobb. You know, over the middle, one deep safety comes up to try to steal the ball. Cobb makes the catch because it's perfectly placed for him. And then there's really nobody between him and the goal line until he gets to about the 10. 
Carlson every week on OTBAM talking about the uh, previous weekend's football. Now, Kian Fahey is with us. we we'll get to him in a minute. I'm going to give you the uh, schedule for this weekend just to try and pick some of these pretty interesting games. Um, the late game on Sunday evening is Giants at Cowboys and Monday night football is Seahawks at Bears. On Thursday, it's the divisional game between the Ravens and the Bengals. Now that I look at it, I realise that these might all be... Uh, uh, divisional games. Let me go and see. Oh, no, they're not. So it's a mix. Uh, okay, so the um, evening slate, the Lions at the 49ers, the Cardinals at the Rams, the Patriots at the Jaguars, which probably is the game of the day, certainly one of them anyway, and the Raiders at the Broncos, the early kickoffs that we're all going to be watching here from 6 o'clock on Sunday, Panthers at Falcons, Colts at Redskins, Texans at Titans, the Eagles at the Buccaneers, the Chiefs at the Steelers, which is also going to be a pretty good game, Dolphins at the Jets, which now all of a sudden looks like it's a, a good game as well. And then there's Chargers at Bills, Vikings at the Packers, also a great game, and uh, Browns at Saints. Uh, Kian Fai, good afternoon to you. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to get to straight off the bat. Sam Darnold might be the real deal, and maybe the New York Jets are right to be going crazy. Yeah, kind of. He, he had a good game. He had a good start. But he also, like, that first play of the game where he threw the ball back across his body for a pick six, that was obviously a crazy, awful play. And it was kind of, it was all because the defense anticipated the uh, bootleg play action and they disrupted Quincy and Unruh working underneath. So he didn't have a check down once his first two receivers recovered. So he forced the ball. That's a typical rookie thing. But throughout that game, Matt Patricia kept throwing three man rushes at him. And what you do with a three man rush normally is you give it with young quarterbacks because the young quarterback is going to rush and panic and he's not going to react to that. He's not going to hold the ball and stay in the pocket like he's supposed to. And at the start, Darnold struggled doing that. He ran backwards at one point to nearly run himself out of field goal range. They still kicked a field goal. He got away with that one. And then he, re- he learned after that. He reacted to it more properly. That's the thing that kind of uh, gives, me, gives me reason to be optimistic. The only thing is he did have three interceptable passes in that game. And one of those was that touchdown, which I feel like... He, he, that touchdown, it was a three-man rush again. He manipulated the coverage, created the opportunity, and just under threw the ball. And if that ball had been caught by the defender like it should have been, I feel like the narrative in Darnold would be very different right now. Well, but even saying that, I'm still positive about it. Let me, let me talk you to you about the uh, interceptable passes because this is something that you watch so many games and you realise that in a lot of games, the defenders really aren't looking at the ball. They're, they're keeping an eye on their man and they're doing their job. And... If they just turned around for a split second and relaxed a bit, they might actually be able to catch it. There is the other side of there too that if they could catch the ball, they wouldn't be playing on defense. So what's a, what's a realistic number of, of interceptable passes that end up being dropped or not intercepted? Uh, it was about 40% of them that were caught last year. But it's not, that's not really the thing that matters. What matters is your event, if you're a quarterback who's throwing a lot of interceptable passes, eventually it's going to catch up to you. And that's what happened with Matthew Stafford. When you're talking about the defenders there, that's something that kind of infuriated me on Monday Night Football because Booger McFarland, who was doing the analysis from the sideline, kept repeatedly saying that, oh, if the defensive backs just turned around, they'd be able to catch the passes. But if you're sprinting in one direction following a receiver who's running away from you and you have to figure out where he's going, how are you going to turn your neck, bend it around like an owl and find the ball while running in the complete opposite direction? It sounds easy, but it's really, really difficult. Some of the uh, some of the good safeties and some of the good linebackers are apparently able to do it, and and maybe they just show up the rest of them because they're actually superhuman. Uh, some of the other uh, narratives from week one, some stuff that we knew to be true going into it that the Bills were going to be awful, that the Raiders were going to be awful. It's good when stuff that you know is true actually turns out to be a hundred percent true. Yeah, it kind of felt like that Raiders game was like their Super Bowl because that stadium was hopping, obviously, and there was this kind of atmosphere of us against the world which they kind of generally have and they did keep it close for the first couple of quarters for the first three quarters they didn't they the big key there was i i didn't really think learn anything new about the raiders in that game but we learned a lot about that rams front seven and i think that's going to be telling moving forward because jared cook shouldn't be catching 150 yards on you he shouldn't be running away from all of your linebackers with ease like jared cook isn't a bad player necessarily. He's just not a good catcher of the ball, and he didn't have any drops in this game. But he's also not the level of talent in terms of running in running routes, in terms of his athleticism, in terms of getting open or catching balls at the, ca- at the catch point over defenders and contested catches. He's not that level of talent where he should look uncoverable. He looked like Rob Gronkowski against the Rams, and that's a, 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 a sign that their linebackers just aren't very good. And it's why Wade Phillips later in the game had to move a keep to leave onto Cook. 
once once uh, once the Rams did that, it should have been easy for the Raiders to move the ball. Amari Cooper should have got target after target after target, but he didn't. So it's the Raiders obviously dysfunctional, obviously a mess. That Derek Carr interception in the second half was unbelievably bad. But I think we learned more about the Rams in this game and how that defense is going to be attacked. Is Derek Carr just a mediocre quarterback? Well, yeah, he, uh, I think he's worse than that. I, I don't think he's even close to a good quarterback. He, he had The reason people think he's good, he had a really high touchdown to interception ratio a couple of years ago, and they had a, a couple of four-quarter comeback wins. The problem with that is that's a tiny sample of what he's doing in a game each week. And with Carr, he, was, he did all that. In a phenomenal, with a phenomenal supporting cast. He had the best offensive line in the league by far. He had good receivers who could adjust at the catch point. He had decent running backs. Running backs who weren't good runners, but they could catch the ball and make guys miss out of the backfield. So when you actually take Carr out of that perfect scenario, you get stuff like that interception on late in the game where he just panics. All it was was a little bit of pressure up the middle. Not pressure that he was going to get sacked or pressure he, he had to move his feet to throw the ball. He just panics because there was someone close to him. He turns around, tries to throw the ball away, and underthrows it by about 15 yards. And that's the kind of thing Carr did all the time. We talked, I talked about interceptable passes. He led the league last year. He had 36. And that's a crazy number for, for someone who only played 16 games. Yeah. I want to move on and just talk about uh, Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs start. There was a fair bit of pressure on Mahomes, obviously, because he was replacing Alex Smith. And we've just been talking about Smith's uh, success at Washington. But like last year, Smith did actually push the ball downfield. And that yeah. was because they had the, the type of receivers who were able to profit from it. But uh, Patrick Mahomes looked amazing the other night. Yeah, he made some crazy throws with his arm. He, he has that big arm. He has that ability to throw off of different platforms. And that's why the Eagles, or that's why the Eagles, sort of Andy Reid, that's why Andy Reid wanted him. That's why he, he drafted him. There, it was also a little bit overblown because two of his touchdowns were basically handoffs. They were those end-around plays where the receiver ran behind the offensive line and took the ball from from uh, from Holmes as he was executing a play fake with the handoff to the running back. He actually just pitched it forward. The receiver caught it and went into the end zone. So the Chargers were nowhere near those two plays. The kind of really telling play was that touchdown to Anthony Sherman deep down the left sideline where... Mahomes didn't necessarily do everything technically right there. He didn't, he didn't necessarily uh, move the pocket the way he should have or set his feet properly with throwing the ball. But you just saw that unbelievable arm strength and that arm, arm talent even to, to bend the ball over the defender and put it perfectly into the fullback running down the field. The other note we need to make on that play is Andy Reid had used Travis Kelsey to take away the deep safety. He used the running back going into the flat to pull the linebacker forward to create that window. If Mahomes had hold, held onto the ball a split second longer, he wouldn't have had to make, have made a phenomenal throw. He would have had a wide open receiver to throw to. The concern is he won't be able to make that phenomenal throw all the time, and he will have interceptions on that type of pass. Whereas if he gets that little bit more technically good in the pocket, he'll have a wide open throw, and it won't be as risky moving forward. Do you do you reevaluate somebody like? the Chiefs in the immediate aftermath of a single game like that and where they stand in terms of the power rankings or overall hierarchy and what their potential outcome for the season is because you know there was that doubt whether or not he was actually going to be up for it and it turns out he sees the game quite slowly with the exception of the, the point you just made and that's coachable and certainly it seems like Andy Reid has a track record of coaching uh, quarterbacks to do that but the rest of the weapons he has are absolutely sensational. Uh, in general, I won't react too much to week one, but in this specific instance, I won't react anyway because I expected this to be the best offense in the league. So it's playing to what I was expecting. Okay. Anything else? Any other takeaways from week one before I ask you about the uh, Pats Jags game? I mean, are you avoiding that 49ers Vikings result in game on purpose? Am I not supposed to talk about it, or am I suddenly going to get cut off here in the middle of this? The the line is breaking up a little bit there. No, it's look. I, I mean, I, I didn't actually watch Red Zone. Uh, I watched that whole game and was like, so Jimmy G's a human being. Uh, <laughs> the, the depth in the offensive line is not particularly good. Uh, Jarek McKinnon is going to be missed. Um, Alfred Morris is like a yard out from tying the game at 10 points all and fumbles. And I, I would like to see what the game is like at 10 points all. But um, I think the Vikings are brilliant. And maybe I'm... I think the positive, the positive sign from that game for the 40, 40, 40 Obviously, the negative side is Garoppolo wasn't good and threw those three interceptions and missed a couple of throws he should have made as well. But the positive sign there is Shanahan pulled that defense apart. He created wide open opportunities for his receivers. And if you're doing that against the Vikings defense, you're going to do that against every single defense in the league. The Vikings defense looks for real. It's phenomenal. Sheldon Richardson on that defensive line, it's unfair. Because like, you need to double every... Like, in, a, in a perfect world, 
Everson Griffin would be your only pass rusher you'd have to deal with. You'd want to double team him. In a perfect world, Daniel Hunter is the only pass rusher you'd have to deal with. You'd want to double team him. In a perfect world, Sheldon Richardson's the only pass rusher you'd want to deal with. You'd want to double team him. So you've now got five offensive linemen to deal with, four defensive linemen, and you need to double team three of them. That's that that's easy math. It's not going to work out. And this new cornerback that they've got, Mike Hughes, the first round pick, he had the pick six, the interception, but that wasn't exactly great coverage by him. That was more opportunistic of him being in the right spot and Grappolo throwing him the ball. But overall in that game, he played really well. And the beauty of him is he was able to move inside and outside seamlessly, which is nothing other than any of their other cornerbacks can do. That's going to be a huge upgrade for them. The other thing I thought about them was that, uh, certainly in that first half, their offense was really good and that Kirk Cousins was finding receivers and finding space and taking time and, and just being very poised. In the second half, actually, the uh, 49ers defense got much better and kind of shut them down and, and actually played quite well for... Uh, a much derided group of players. Um, that's putting the 49ers spin on it. But I think that, like, if you're the Vikings, you feel like you've got an upgrade at quarterback and you feel like you've got a real chance this year. Yeah, I did want to note um, the Forrest Buckner had three sacks in the game, but two of them were when Cousins ran into him, so they weren't really anything spectacular. But behind the Forrest Buckner, Fred Warner, who played inside linebacker, was phenomenal. He, he really, really stood out. He's a rookie third round pick. I had no idea what, about expecting what to see from him coming into the game. I hadn't really thought about him because he was a third round pick. But he, he looked outstanding in a game where the the defense as a whole wasn't great for the first half, like you said. The like I'm a, I'm not a big Cousins guy. I think you've got the whole kind of arc of Cousins in that game where he made mistakes, he limited the offense at times. But then he did make two throws that I actually didn't even think he was capable of making. The Stefan Sorry, the Stefan Diggs touchdown down the left sideline was a perfectly thrown pass into a tiny window. It hit Diggs in the chest, easy catch for Diggs, easy touchdown. The Kyle Rudolph touchdown down the seam was a phenomenal throw as well. You don't get these from Cousins. And the fact you've got two in one game is very rare. And I don't think that's going to happen regularly. But at least it's giving you the, the, the optimism or the re- a reason to be excited about his potential. The only big concern with him right now, he cannot connect with Adam Thielen. He, he, uh, before that dig touchdown, he completely missed him on a deep corner route. When he hit him on a slant route earlier in the game, Thielen dropped the ball. When he was working outside on a comeback route, uh, Cousins threw the ball high and too far inside him. Thielen managed to reach back and get it, give him an opportunity to catch the ball. But those two, for whatever reason, Cousins and Diggs, great rapport, getting the ball perfectly into the right spots. Thielen and Cousins, just not working. Yeah, if they get that later in the season, they'll definitely be an unbelievable offense. Um, a, a quick word then about uh, Khalil Mack and the whole Aaron Rodgers uh, comeback scenario. You know, part of me thinks that it's, a, it's brilliant for the Bears to in a way, have like lost the game and to get so close and to feel, okay, they've got a sense of mission there to overcome it. But at the same time, they put up their points when Rodgers wasn't on the field. And uh, in retrospect, away from the heat of the game, you're like, come on, lads, you kind of needed to win that. Yeah, you, I, came out, I came away from that game thinking you should feel positive. The only criticisms I would have is Matt Nagy should have gone for it in fourth down. And Mr. Trubisky missed a couple of open receivers. He didn't see them that he should have thrown to in the second half when I think he probably got a little bit tight, kind of got a little bit, oh, I'm on the road against Aaron Rodgers. It's, we're expect, we've expectations. I got a bit nervous. But that team is going to beat most teams because most teams don't get that Aaron Rodgers display. That Aaron Rodgers display is like I, I've run out of like people ask me to talk about Aaron Rodgers and I'm just like, I don't know what to say anymore. He's just perfect at everything. He's or not perfect at everything, but he's better than everyone else at everything. That touchdown to Geronimo Allison is a throw that I've never seen any other quarterback make. And I literally sat down and watched it 40 or 50 times afterwards. Because he's moving to his left. He's outside the left hash mark. He's 60 yards away if it was a straight line. So he's probably 70 yards actually throwing the ball. And he hits Allison in his chest just outside the reach of the cornerback. In stride, perfectly on line, just inside of the and in, in, or inside of the sideline, so the receiver doesn't have to reach over. He doesn't have to make any kind of difficult catch. That's a ridiculous throw. How does anyone stop that? Nobody can stop that. So for the Bears, yeah, you've got stuff to work on. You need things to get better. Cleo Mack had a phenomenal game. Cleo Mack had a recovered fumble, a forced fumble, a sack, an interception, an interception return for a touchdown. The last player to do that was Cleo Mack like five years ago. So Khalil Mack was everything is advertised, but Aaron Rodgers is just better than everyone else. Yeah. And that's going to happen sometimes. And Khalil Mack not even properly fully fit yet. One last thing, right? So for the last three, four weeks, just before the season started, there were these constant rumours that Randall Cobb was going to get traded. And you felt like, ooh, this, that, I mean, that'll be a bit of a... That'll be a second kick in the teeth for Aaron Rodgers just before the season starts, unless he wanted rid of him. But then they have this unbelievable chemistry where Randall Cobb suddenly looks like... You know, he's he's entering his peak as opposed to somebody who was supposed to be in his peak two, three years ago. 
Well, that's the thing you can always measure in week one. You you can't really make widespread statements or predictions based on week one because the matchups, because randomness, because it's still just one of 17 weeks. But what you can do is figure out how physically healthy guys are. I would say the same about Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck looks physically healthy. He had a couple of bad throws, bad decisions. But physically, he's back to where he needs to be. Same with Ryan Tannehill. He's back to where he needs to be. Deshaun Watson as well. So Randall Cobb's big issue has been he has looked so slow over recent years that he has not been able to create any separation. So in this game, he had that one big play. And that big play, I kind of, as soon as he caught the ball, I assumed he was going to get caught from behind because over the last couple of years, he would have got caught from behind. Hmm. Now there's a little bit more explosiveness there. There's a little bit more athleticism there. Maybe you could be more optimistic about him. I still don't think he's what he was early in his career. He didn't look like he had that quickness there. But he's enough there that you can expect him to stay in the Packers and be a productive player with Aaron Rodgers. Part of that might also be that they had a, their second-year player. I, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he went on IOR at just before the start of the season. So I think some of that trade talk for Cobb was that they expected someone else to take his job, and that just didn't happen. Okay. I want to move on to this weekend. So the Patriots at the Jags. The Patriots started off not favoured for this, but uh, the money came for them pretty quickly. And so now the uh, Jags are a touch over even, and uh, the Patriots are a, a touch in odds on at this point. Uh, I'm interested in this game. I don't know if um, the Patriots really actually deserve to beat the Jaguars last time. These times, these teams met. And uh, I think that maybe, like, another year removed from his injury, Miles Jack is, like, this absolutely sensational player who really now looks like a complete steal wherever they got him in the second round, or was it even later in the draft? Uh, I don't know. It just feels like it's, it's a really bad Patriots receiving core to the point where they're picking up anybody they can get their hands on, surely this is the day where the Jags just come out and beat the shit out of them. <laughs> yeah, well, they picked up Corey Coleman and they've got Cordell Patterson in their offense and basically their offense is Rob Gronkowski and everyone and a bunch of guys. Chris Hogan is still there, but he didn't really have much of an impact against the Texans as far as I remember. Um, look, the, the Jaguars, yeah, I agree with you. The Jaguars should have beaten the Patriots in the playoffs last year, but the same problem is still there. Blake Bortles is still the quarterback. He didn't play well in week one. He didn't change anyone's mind about anything in week one. And he's playing against... He's not playing against a better defense, but he's playing against a better coach. The big kind of change up here for the Jaguars is they go from having to deal with Odell Beckham, having to deal with Sterling Shepard, having to deal with Evan Engram, guys who are very difficult to cover and who stress the defense a lot more than the guys the Patriots are going to put out there. But Tom Brady is so much better than Blake Bortles, or so much better than Eli Manning, rather, that it's still a significant challenge. I actually think this will be a similar game for the Jaguars than, like, like it was last week, because they're going to get in Bra- they're going to disrupt Brady enough that they're going to keep the score to like 21, 24, 27 points. And then the question mark is, can the offense get that far against what is a bad Patriots defense? The Patriots defense looks better this year than it did last year, but it's really not saying much. Yeah, so it sounds like you're saying the Patriots will probably just squeak out a win there. Um, on the road, I'd be more likely to take the Jaguars, but I think it'll be a very close game. I, I don't really think there's a, a strong decision there that, that's obvious to everyone. Like that, Even the, the playoff game last year, it, it was really close. So it's if you're basing it off of that, and when we did that with the Eagles-Falcons, it worked because that was a very similar game again in, on Thursday night last week. Yeah. If you're basing it off the playoff game last year, these teams haven't changed that much that they're going to be that much different. So I think it will be a close game again. Um, I, I do want to talk to you about the, the Steelers-Browns game, just in kind of more in the prism of, of this week's game. Uh, it's the Chiefs at the Steelers. The, the Browns' ability to come back from 21-7 down against the Steelers is, is kind of a little bit weird, considering this is supposed to be... Uh, I mean, it is a team who, now that they've got a tie, have had their best start of the season since 2004. <laughs> they've won one game in two seasons. Like, it, you know, this is supposed to be a flaky organisation that a uh, winning culture and team like the Steelers just has their finger on their throat and doesn't let go. But all of a sudden, it's like, are the Steelers any good? Miles Garrett destroyed that second half a little bit for the Steelers, so that's it, kind of underselling the Browns a little bit if, if we kind of treat them as just being the Browns. Miles Garrett was brilliant. Denzel Ward was really good as well. But the big story from that game was Ben Roethlisberger just throwing the ball to defenders over and over again. And that's something he's done regularly over the past couple of years. He's the only quarterback to have four interception games on twice over, since the start of last season. No other quarterback has had more than one. And there's only three quarterbacks have had, have had four interception games. Matthew Stafford added to that list this week as well. The, 
reason I would be taking the Chiefs in this game is because of the offense rather than their defense going against Roethlisberger, though, because Roethlisberger is generally a lot better at home than he is on the road. The James Conner looks good enough for them to be effective. He's obviously not Le'Veon Bell. The offense is going to be fine. But Patrick Mahomes set up in that offense with Tyreek Hill, with Sammy Watkins, with all of these speed receivers. Travis Kelsey, just gonna, they, they're, gonna have, they're not going to have anyone to cover Travis Kelsey without Ryan Shazier. Even if Ryan Shazier was healthy and available, he wouldn't be able to either. Vince Williams is more of a run-stopping linebacker than a coverage linebacker. So the, your best hope for the Steelers is that Mahomes has that negative downside that we didn't see at all in week one, where he's throwing the ball to defenders and he's panicking and he's, he's not getting the ball out quickly enough or making pre-snap reads quick enough or, or smartly enough. So I, I think the Steelers have reasons to be concerned, but I also just think the Chiefs are a better team here. So if they lose to the Chiefs, it's not really a major point of, hey, this they, they might be much worse than we expected them to be. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a narrative about Big Ben that he kind of uses September as the preseason and comes good and we shouldn't really worry about the entire organization because they know exactly what it takes to get into the offseason and they still have Antonio Brown. So, you know, they're always going to be competitive in every game. So I, I guess, look, we can stick a, a fork in that one for now and, and see how that one rolls. Uh, well, one final team I wanted to talk to you about was the, the Chargers. I want to talk about the Saints as well. But the Chargers and the preseason hype about the Chargers was that they had a, the potential to be a Super Bowl team, the way they finished last season in particular. But then suddenly Joey Bosa's is injured and it's like, well... They're a little bit toothless, and they managed to be 14-0 down in the blink of an eye against uh, the Chiefs last week. So, are they for real? Are they a real team at the moment? What did I tell you in our, our, our preview? What, what, what was it when you asked me about the Chargers? They're going to be the Chargers again this season. There you go. That's what's happening. That's, it's, that's all this is. As soon as you saw Joey Bosa was hurt again, it's, they're the Chargers. This is what, this is what happens. Everyone gets hurt. Nothing, nothing functions the way you expect it to function. And it's just falling apart. And at least they're doing it early this year. Last year they did it early too, but they rebounded over the second half of the season. I, I think the Chiefs there, a big part of that was just the overall speed of the Chiefs offense. The Chiefs offense was so much faster than the Chargers defense. Derwin James looked really good as a free safety. But when that defense doesn't have Bosa, it doesn't have Jason Barrett, it doesn't, uh, one of the other cornerbacks is hurt as well. So it, it just doesn't have enough, and it, it's, it's going to be a problem all year. And Philip Rivers isn't at the point where he can be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL anymore, I don't think, because his arm has suffered so much. Keenan Allen is still phenomenal. Melvin Gordon is very good. The offensive line is decent, better than it was in recent years. But overall, you kind of expected them to lose to the Chiefs that way because the Chiefs are just on a different level to them. And that's not even saying something to compliment the Chiefs. It's just that the Chargers aren't this team that is spectacular that everyone thinks they are. They've just got names that people recognise a little bit more than others. Luckily, though, they've got the Bills this week. If you ever want to realize oh, yeah. something, the Bills are the perfect team to be riding into town, right? Or even you've got to go to Buffalo. I don't care. They're like seven and a half points uh, favourites for that. They're surely going to kill them. Yeah, they didn't even look like an NFL team on, on Sunday. The, the Ravens, I, I've never seen a team win by 40 points or whatever it was and, win, and not look good. The Ravens didn't even look good in that game. It was just the Bills were awful. They were, they were Michael Crabtree at one point ran over the middle of the field and there was at least 25 yards between him and the closest defender in the middle of the field. Like It wasn't like he was running down the sideline wide open. The defense was an absolute disaster. No one was in, in position at all. They convert, Joe Flacco converted a, a second and 26 when John Brown was wide open by about 15 yards past the, line of screen, past the first down line. That's, like, that's college stuff. That's not even college stuff. That's high school stuff. That should not be in the NFL and the Chargers should blow him out as well. But I... Like if this Bills team avoids going zero and sixteen, it's an achievement. Yeah, I mean, so is the is the thinking you get your quarterback, you kind of don't really try and use him this year, and then next year you still get the first pick to try and put weapons in from. I don't really understand the thinking. Why get your quarterback now? Why not wait until next year? You, you, there, there, you can't understand that thinking because there isn't any logic there. They traded away all the parts of their, parts of their offense to get a quarterback, a quarterback who. Like it, it, the big criticisms of Tyrod Taylor were all he is is an athlete. He doesn't have any pocket awareness, and he he, he misses open receivers downfield. That's the perfect description of Josh Allen. That's exactly what Josh Allen is. So they've gone out and invested high picks in a quarterback who is everything that they dislike in a quarterback. They put him into the offense after Nathan Peterman crashed for three quarters. They put him into the offense, and he did exactly what he did in college: ran into sacks, missed wide open receivers, and invited pressure onto himself. 
And then you have guys like Kelvin Benjamin who dropped a, dropped a touchdown and dropped another back shoulder throw. It wasn't a great back shoulder throw. But you have those guys who are going to drop passes. So everything in that offense outside of LeSean McCoy is a net negative. You can't have 10 net negatives and LeSean McCoy and expect to have a decent offense or even a decent team. Now, anything else this week uh, that people should be looking out for ahead of the weekend or any other stories you think that we should be covering? Well, I think the Saints' loss in week one was huge. And I, I, I kind of, we kind of talked about this yesterday on a podcast I did, but unfortunately the file corrupted, so we don't actually have it to, to <laughs> reference to it. But, um, it happens yeah, to right, everybody. <laughs> well, <laughs> the Ryan Fitzpatrick game was... It was a little bit about Ryan Fitzpatrick, him trying to ball up for grabs and his receivers getting it. But the biggest thing I took away from that game, besides the two fumbles that are really timely in punishment for the Saints, very unlucky there, one of them bounced into a linebacker's hands who was in a full sprint going to the end zone, so that was never going to be stopped. But the big takeaway was their defensive game plan. They put Marshawn Lattimore on an island against Mike Evans. They put uh, Von Bell in press aggressive coverage against OJ Howard. And they put Ken Crawley in press aggressive, aggressive coverage against Deshaun Jackson. That's the best skill position players in the league. You don't press them and put your cornerbacks in space against them. Entering week one, we all talked about uh, Jalen Ramsey versus Odell Beckham. And one of the things I stressed was, this is not a one-on-one matchup. Nobody in the NFL puts their cornerback one-on-one against the wide receiver. Because no matter how good your cornerback is, he's not going to stop any of the best receivers in the NFL in one-on-one in space. And yet, the Saints did that. They put all of their cornerbacks in one-on-ones in space. So Ryan Fitzpatrick just had to loft the ball up in the air. He even missed a wide-open, like a 70-yard touchdown to Deshaun Jackson late in the game. And Jackson still got 40 yards or 30 yards out of it because he was so far in behind the defender that he could wait and catch the ball and fall down. So... That's a major concern for what you expect to be one of the best teams in the league, but they're playing the Browns this week, so it probably won't matter. Are Tampa Bay any good, though? Like, so, you know, they're, they're front seven. So, again, the hard knocks effect last season, everyone's like, ooh, they've got a lot of really good players in that team. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe uh, Jameis has matured. We didn't know what was going on in the background, but their front seven has actually got even better. They did add and they invested in it over the summer. Is there a possibility that Tampa Bay are actually a post-hype decent team? I think Vinnie Curry is a nice addition, but I don't think the front seven was really that much better. So, like, the, the Saints still scored a lot of points and did pretty much what they wanted to do on offense. They stayed in their base defense a lot, which means they kept three linebackers on the field with four defensive linemen. And what the Saints did was just put Michael Thomas... Michael Thomas had something like 16 receptions. So they put Michael Thomas in the slot or moved him on short crossing routes, and he'd get matched up with Quan Alexander and Levante David, big linebackers who aren't going to be able to run with Michael Thomas. And then they would also use, when, when Michael Thomas was outside, they would bring Alvin Kamara out of the backfield or move him into the slot from the start and run option routes against those linebackers. And the Buccaneers never adjusted to that. Yeah. So defensively, there's a major concern there. Offensively, yeah, if you get competent quarterback play all year, that offense is going to be really, really, really good. Do you expect to get competent uh, offense or quarterback play from Ryan Fitzpatrick? Probably not. Do you expect to get it from Jameis Winston? Probably not. There's your concern. I think the most interesting part of this team is do they actually start Winston again once he comes back from suspension? Because I'm not really sure I would. No, you uh, you cut your losses and you decide that that is not what you want associated with your franchise. Or you try and trade him to somebody desperate who might give you a fifth or sixth round pick for him. Kim, well, I think you might get, you might actually get more than that because he, he is so, so highly thought of. He He's so highly thought of amongst NFL people. I, I, it's because that draft process is so important to people. Like that, that's why you see guys like Christian Hackenberg getting drafted or getting opportunity after opportunity, even when they're terrible. That's why Blaine Gabbert was Marcus Mariota's replacement in Week One, still, even though. Everyone knows he can't play quarterback. Yeah. I wonder, does Nike's share price going up and their sales going up make it more likely that one of these teams is going to go, you know what, I'm going to give Colin Kaepernick a go here? Because actually, I've seen the uh, YouTube clip of him absolutely destroying the Green Bay Packers quite a while ago. But still, it's better than playing fucking Gabbert. I think if we were ever going to get to that point, we would have been there by now because... The difference, like Kevin Ho- the, the, the Broncos picked up Kevin Hogan last week. Kevin Hogan, who I charted last year when he played that one start for the Browns, had a bigger challenge keeping the ball on the field than throwing it over the sideline. <laughs> that guy, and he, and when if you don't have the hash marks in the football field, one's on the right, one's on the left, about I think 10, 15 yards away from each other. When he was on the right hash mark, throwing to the near side of the field, the near numbers, in other words, the shortest possible throw you can make, he threw the ball like a balloon. He went up in the air, it took 10 minutes to get to his receiver. He physically cannot play a quarterback, and yet he's on the Broncos roster. It's a fair point. Kean, as ever, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks, man.
It's uh, Kian Fahey with us here on the NFL show on Off the Ball every week. If uh, you haven't already subscribed to this, you can get this in the highlights reel of uh, our podcast. Just go along to highlights and hit the uh, subscribe button there if you want the audio only feed. And of course, we're all over our social channels, facebook.com forward slash off the ball. It's worth subscribing there. You can also turn your notifications on on YouTube. So whenever we go live, We'll hit you with a notification and uh, you'll know that you're not missing any of our good stuff. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter as well, at Off The Ball or at Off The Ball AM. Uh, I hope you enjoy whatever happens in uh, week two for your team. We'll see you next week. Until then, go easy.